today, uh, I'm very challenged as I step up here to try to just cooperate more completely with what God's desiring to do. I uh, kind of made my way around behind the, everybody as they were worshiping, and I was just looking and just watching the various expressions of worship. So appreciate our next generation church leaders and making their way down front. Can you just help me say a great big thanks to all of our Destiny youth. Come on, they are rocking it. Love and appreciate you guys so much. Such a heart and a passion just for the things of God. And uh, as I'm just kind of watching what that looks like, you know, we all have different expressions, don't we? Uh, some of us are more expressive than others. It's really not about the, the quantity of expression as it is what's going on inside. And that was what I just began to register and, and was just pondering. I was just kind of back over in the shadows over there just praying, asking the Lord, what's going on in the heart of your people? That's what really matters when we're in worship, isn't it? It's what's going on in you. How many of you know in life that's what really matters, what's going on in you? Uh, I, I want you to jot this down, if you would, on your note card. It's just a really good phrase to remember. I had the privilege of speaking to our uh, community leadership structure called DelQuest this last week. Pastor Chris, who's the president of the chamber, uh, is the facilitator for that. And so we uh, take applications and we interview all these juniors in public school, private school, home school, and there are a number of them selected, about 30, 25 or 30, and not all of them are selected. It really is quite a, a rigorous process. And then they walk through all kinds of introductions to various community leaders. Um, they meet officials on Tinker. They meet the people who oversee police, fire chief, uh, hospital. They wound up graduating in the state capitol building, having met senators, representatives. They kind of get a picture of what it takes for a community to function. So I get to be the, the faith community representative that speaks to these students, and I just share straight up Jesus with them. And I just tell them, in our community, there is, there is a focal point that we bring of a community of believers that are led by various pastors and spiritual leaders, and it's a very important decision you make. But the idea that I shared is simply this phrase, and this is what I want to ask you to write down. Life's never about what happens to me. Life's always about what happens in me when things happen to me. Life's never about what happens to me. Life is always <clears throat> about what happens in me when things happen to me. How many of you had some things happen to you? Had some things happen to you. But the question, and, and it's kind of what I was looking at as I was watching worship take place, the question really is what's going on inside? What's taking place inside? And so I work really hard to try and develop and sculpt ideas and messages and, you know, really strong scripture uh, depth for us as a church family. And, and so I not only come, you know, having worked hard to prepare a message, but I've really sought the Lord and ask God, what is the revelation that he wants to deposit? The message is kind of secondary to what God wants to reveal within us. It's the whole essence of what I'm trying to talk to you about. And the Holy Spirit just began to speak to me that particularly over the, over the course of the next seven days. How many of you want to hear what the Lord has to say about what we're about to experience, right? I mean, I, that's really what I want to know. I, I really want to know I mean, I desperately want to know what God wants to do. I don't want to be distracted from that. If, of anything else, that's what I want to really be focused in on. And the Holy Spirit said to me that he is about to empower us. Everybody say us. I'm talking to you. I'm talking to me. He's about to empower us that over the course of the next seven days, we are going to enter into a place of great joy, casting off heaviness, breaking into a place of great celebration of what God wants to do in our hearts. God wants to do something powerful in your heart. And so I just want to, I want you to be prepared for that as we start to walk through this together. And Father, I pray in Jesus' mighty name that you would awaken something of the Spirit. That which is of the Spirit gives birth to the things of the Spirit, and that of the flesh gives birth to the things of the flesh. Lord, we don't want a religious flesh message idea just to talk around and clap our hands to and say amen to. We want to experience a transaction from heaven in our hearts that will transform our lives and the world around us in Jesus' powerful name. 
name. You have deposited something powerful in your people. And I pray, God, you would awaken that today as deep as calling to deep. Let your word enrich our lives. Let your spirit, Lord, blow upon the word, the seeds of your word. May they begin to flourish and produce something powerful that would truly transform the world around us in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Come on, if you have faith for that today, why don't you celebrate it and call it in. In the name of Jesus, we declare with our amen, with our celebration, with our yes, God wants to do something in our hearts. God wants to do something in our hearts. Sin is what we do in our hearts when we've decided God is not enough. God wants to do something in our heart. What's going on in your heart is incredibly important every moment of your life. Guard your heart with all diligence. Guard your heart. Protect the, de- the deposits that are, that are being made in your heart. Sin is what we do in our heart when we've determined God is not enough and we're searching for something else. We're looking through the trees that we shouldn't be looking through, Adam and Eve. God wants to do something deep in our heart and wants to awaken something within us. And I just say, I want to I really specifically serve notice as we're just looking into what God's desiring to speak and reveal, but I want to serve notice on a, a spiritual skepticism that tries to take hold of our faith. I mean, no, it's easy to grow skeptical. We start feeling like, well, I'm not sure. You know, maybe it's really no breakthrough. Maybe, you know, it's not for me. Can it really happen? We tend to allow these sediments and these levels of skepticism start to build up on our lives and hold us back from everything God wants to do. And I just want to say, by the Spirit of God, rise up out of that today and declare God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above and beyond all we can ask or imagine. Come on, God's power is bigger than our ability to dream. That's what that's saying. Awaken it in your heart. Let it wake up in your heart. So we're going to be empowered today, particularly over the next seven days, but not just limited to the next seven days. We're going to be empowered to be able to walk this out ongoingly in our lives. We start to set a pattern in motion that releases something of the Spirit. So when uh, I, I thought about this when I was a young father and, and we had just had our first child, and, and then Lexi was coming along, and they were just 15 months apart. And Faith, she had, uh, she had stood up, but she wasn't really walking. She could stand and, and kind of, you know, balance okay. She was on the verge of taking steps, and I got really excited. As a dad, I'm like, I can finally play with my child, you know. I can find, we can do stuff together. And so I was ready, to, you know, to go mountain climbing or something, you know. Just so far, just been a baby that I was holding. We were making sure she was, now she was standing. And so I think to myself, she's standing, we can play ball. It was great. So I got a ball, and it was a big ball. It wasn't that heavy, but it was big. And, and, I, and, I, and I'm, I'm like going to teach her, Faith, you're going to learn how to catch. We're going to play ball. I'm going to throw you the ball, and you're going to throw the ball back. How I many you know even an infant should be able to understand something that simple? And so here, here it comes, and, and I threw the ball. And you know, you know what I learned? Kids don't have any capacity whatsoever to put their hands up and catch a ball when you throw a ball to them unless they have learned a ball is about to come my way and I need to catch the ball. She didn't do anything. She just stood there like this. The ball hit her in the face. She then lost her balance and fell down and started to cry. And I thought, what a wimp. That is not how you play ball. I don't win father of the year very often. But, I, you know, I, honestly, I, I, there was just this, I had no thought whatsoever that she hadn't learned hand-eye coordination, catch a ball. You know, it just wasn't in my mind at all. And, and, and over the course of time, how many of you know that's kind of what happens with this in life? We learn to react and protect ourselves with these self-preserving attitudes and reactions when we've been hit in the face often enough, knocked around because difficult situations come our way. When we first are born, we don't have the capacity or the ability or the skepticism to react to every situation that happens. But over the course of time, when you get banged around enough, you start to have a lot of self-preserving reactions. Am I talking to anybody? All of a sudden, I'm self-preserving in my reactions to situations. I've been hurt enough times, I really don't want to be hurt anymore. And slowly, skepticism starts to take over. And I believe today, God really wants to deconstruct this a little bit. 
Two of the most powerful words known to mankind. Thank you. Thank you. This is my only shot to talk to you about Thanksgiving, and it fit beautifully with what I was sensing was from the Lord, and, and this is the week for us to really engage on this level. Thank you. Two of the most powerful words known to mankind. Thank you. Now, now remember, criticism tends to be more powerful than appreciation. And the reason criticism tends to be more, it doesn't have to be, but it tends to be more powerful than appreciation. And the reason criticism is more powerful than appreciation is because criticism is very specific. Normally, you don't generally criticize somebody. There's something that has that you've noticed something that's irritated you, you specifically criticize. That's why there's such power in criticism. But gratitude or being thankful to somebody, many times when we're trying to voice appreciation or, or thanksgiving, what we're doing is just voicing something general. I appreciate you. Well, thank you. I, I, I'm glad you said that. But it's not specific. So if you want to make your thankfulness or your gratitude as powerful or more so, than your criticism, then be specific. I don't just thank Brian and Lori Hart because they lead a community group and I and there are featured community group leaders of the morning. Uh, and you'll see a handsome picture of them in just a bit. Well, a beautiful picture of her and him beside her. And so I don't just appreciate Brian and Lori Hart uh, just because they're awesome, though they are, but I am so thankful for what Lori brings to this platform in a place of worship and what this man of God brings in the face of people that he's pastoring and shepherding as a community community group leader. There is something courageous, something powerful, something bold, and something ferocious about your lives, and I'm thankful for that. Now, that has power. That has power because it's specific. Two of the most powerful words known to mankind, thank you. So this week, I want to encourage you to write thank you cards. You know, we've had those cards up. And uh, you're going to probably snatch up the final few that are on the tables because I want to encourage you to write thank you cards to people this week. I want you to be very specific. Thank you to somebody you work with, neighbor, whatever. Somebody that you can appreciate something very specific about. As you go out, you'll find the Destiny thank you cards on the tables if there are any left. And if not, then come up with your own, okay? But this week, I want, I want to ask you to pick two people to really impact by being very specific about thanking them. And what that's going to do do is encourage them, but it will also transform you because what happens when we start to voice our thankfulness or our gratitude, it's really the essence of worship. You understand? You enter the gates, uh, enter his courts with thanksgiving, enter his gates with praise, enter his courts with what? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is first, having a thankful heart. And there's something that will happen with them, but folks, there's something that actually happens with you. And it begins to awaken an element, an expression, a tremor of worship of God's kingdom invading your life. It's powerful. In fact, this shows up in a lot of practical ways. If you'll learn gratitude, it'll transform what's going on in your heart. And that's what I want to talk to you about. What's going on in your heart? When things are happening to you, what's going on in you? And if you'll pause in those moments when things are happening to you and find something to be thankful about, about it will transform what's going on within you. Dating articles suggest that if you want to be attractive and get a girlfriend or a boyfriend, then learn to be grateful. This is just some practical research that I've found. A physically less, attra a physically less attractive person who has a good attitude is far more attractive than a physically attractive person who's a big complainer. How many know that's true? I mean, it's just dating, but dating 101. What is, what's, the, what's the rule? Just have a good attitude. Be thankful. Here, here's business 101. The biggest turnoff in business in our world today is a lack of gratitude from that company. Personal finance, gratitude is the number one mindset for making wealth, for building a positive and attractive attitude that attracts wealth into your life. Have a good attitude. Learn to somebody just say thank you. Thank you, God. Thank you to our church family. Thank you for this word. Thank you for the deposit that's going on. Thank you, Lord. This is going to be a week of releasing something. This is a week I'm just declaring to you, this is a week where good things are about to be unlocked because we're unlocking them with an attitude of gratitude this morning in Jesus' name. How many of you know there's some good reports coming this week? I'm believing for some good reports. I'm just telling you, we need to learn this principle. We need to learn this principle. 
In times of great challenge, you have to allow God to have his way in your heart. When, when questions come your way, I, I shared with my, about my mom recently, and, and suddenly she had this mess and had to, you know, this started getting concerned about it, and they went in, and, and we just said, you know, we're not going to just react in fear and say, well, we hope everything works out. We're going to ask God what he has to say. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me as I was praying personally about all of that, that every element of the armor covers on purpose except the back, because God's got your back. So I just began to declare to my my mom about that mass on her back. God's got your back. And so we celebrated that as a church as she went in and they, they found that, that they cut that out and it was all fine. It was benign. But what we didn't say was after that, they found spots on her lungs. And so what do you do when they find spots on your lungs? Because that's very, very concerning. And so they, they, the whole progression of all of it, we just began to say the same thing. What do we say? God's got your back. You know what we were doing? We were allowing God to do something in us instead of the circumstances to take control. You can sail into the storm and declare peace be still if you won't let the storm get in your heart. You have the ability to do what I'm talking to you about. And so we just kept proclaiming that. And we kept proclaiming that. And then she went in for this, this procedure. And guess what? They came back and they said, benign. Everything's fine. No cancer. And then my dad had some, man, I'll tell you what, my parents have worn me out recently. My dad had some questions. He had to go to the doctor and they put our minds at ease with their reports this last week. And I'm declaring over Nancy in Jesus name that your vibrancy is returning in the mighty name of God. Come on. There've been some challenges this week. Declaring over the Price family, continued good reports in Jesus' mighty name. What a concerning situation that was. But you sailed into that storm and we declared, peace be still. I'm saying, peace be still to some of your situations today. In the name of, somebody ought to give thanks to God for what he's unlocking in your life. In this moment in time, in Jesus' mighty name, God is able, God is strong, God is mighty, God is our healer, God is our provider. Health and wellness article, gratitude is essential for happiness. You know, it seems your attitude determines your altitude in every area of life. I mean, it really seems. Your attitude, what's going on in you, determines your altitude, how high you're going to go in that area of your life. When you're willing to get this, maybe this is what God had in mind when he wrote in the instruction manual for the human body, the instruction manual, manual for humanity, that's the word of God. When he said, 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, give thanks in every circumstance. Give thanks in every circumstance. How many know that is not easy to do? <laughs> And I've had some rough circumstances that I've chosen to give thanks in, but I just have to tell you, my job, what I do, introduces me to the craziest sets of circumstances on an ongoing, every single day basis. And some of the things that I hear are so outrageous. I mean, I, I, I sometimes have to really step back and just know, okay, Jesus came out of that grave like death couldn't hold his body in. There's no limit to the power of God, no matter what situation may come your way, my way. That's the authority and the power that we have to conquer those situations. And we can give thanks in every one of those. You can find yourself in a tomb, and you can give thanks in that circumstance. I'm speaking proverbially, but I'm just declaring it looks like something died in your life. Give thanks in that circumstance. But, Pastor, it died. I mean, this looks really bad. I'm not asking what it looks like. I'm saying find some way to give thanks in that circumstance. It might not look what you want it to look like, but find some way in that circumstance to begin to give thanks to God. It's not that God causes those situations, it's that God uses those situations when we allow him to take control of whatever's going on. It's not joy that will make us thankful, it's gratitude that will make us joyful. You get it? This is the key that unlocks. So every day this week, I hope you'll wake up and just say, thank God for what? Through the course of the day, I hope you'll send messages to people. I thank God for what? Before you go to bed at night, I hope you'll just pause and just give thanks to God. Scripture suggests 
that Jesus had this attitude that was attractive to children. Isn't it interesting? The disciples said, you know, hey, keep the kids away. And Jesus said, no, bring them here. Bring them here. I mean, that, that, I just love what's being depicted there. When I think of Jesus, I think of a warm, inviting, loving disposition to all humanity. I mean, it's, it's amazing to really think in those terms. Obviously, uh, this attitude existed within the ultimate example of God's love in the earth. And then the Bible says, now that that's a context for us, then the Bible says in Philippians 2, 5, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. <laughs> your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. You know, I, I experienced something. I feel like I'm in re really different rhythm with you today. And I just want to cooperate with whatever God's wanting to do. But, but I experienced something standing down there when Angie Lowe got up here. And worship's going, and, and as she walked up, there was just something of a spiritual confidence that you carry as a communicator. And I so love it. I so value it. Because as soon as she started speaking, the confidence she was ex expressing started to fill my heart and awaken my faith. And I just thought, we are, go I mean, just something in me came alive. There was an awakening. You know, God wants to do something in our hearts. Something in me just started coming alive. There's just this awakening of what God is desiring to accomplish as I began to, to just establish that. And, and I, I, you know, I'm just going to be real honest with you. This week, I actually sat down with Tracy and the girls, my family, in my home. And I said these words because I thought of this conversation as I watched uh, Angie's confidence. Great uh, example of Christ. You and Zach both. I just love and appreciate you guys. And I'm thankful for your ministry here to our school, your ministry here to our youth. Your wonderful example is a married couple who waited until they were married and celebrated that choice. And your 11 children, is that how many you're going to have? They're having lots of kids. <laughs> the wait was over. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> so I, I came in, I, I mean, I think I was carrying some things, you know, burdens this week, but I came in and I actually said to Tracy, Faith, and Lexi, and this might shock you, <clears throat> probably will, but I just said, you know, I'm really not sure that I'm that great of a Christian. I said, I, you know, I'm just not sure that I really carry the attitude of Christ the way I really should carry the attitude of Christ. And here I am, a pastor, and I'm preaching to you. I was in New Mexico last week, preaching to them. Spent two days, really intense days, integrating some curriculum we do with our school, with a Christian school there, connected well with all their 7th through 12th graders and all those kids. I mean, I, I probably left there, and most of those kids had really bought in. This guy, he's a really good guy, really loves God. And, and I'm driving home, and, and I'm thinking, you know, am I really... Anybody ever feel this way? Anybody ever just wonder, am I really a very good Christian? I mean, let's just go basic today. <clears throat> and I just feel like it's something today that we all need to really look at. It's not about us trying to work hard to represent him well, but it's about our learning how to die to ourselves so he can live through our surrendered available life. And, I, and I've been pondering this, and I, I'm about to just go into a season of fasting and prayer personally. I'm going to invite you the first 21 days of the year. We're going to do a Daniel fast emphasis for our first 40 day of the year focus, but I want to do that 21 day prayer focus. But this is, this is what I was thinking as I was pondering all this conversation. You know when I am the most like Jesus? When I've been fasting, and I am hungry, and I am weak, and I am not searching for food. That's when I'm most like Jesus. <clears throat> Not when I'm hangry, okay? <laughs> Just because you're hungry doesn't mean you're Christ-like. But when I'm, when I'm hungry, <laughs> no need to say anything. Man, my family, they, they think I get mad when I get hungry, but I don't. I just get hungry loud. <laughs> but when I'm hungry because I'm fasting and I'm not searching for food, that's when my energy level just kind of calms. I'm not, you know, what's wrong with these lights? What's wrong with the trees? What trees are? What I? I'm, sometimes I'm not very much like Jesus. 
but I'm hungry and I just don't have the energy to produce such a fleshly reaction because I'm starting to be more in touch with the spirit man in my life. Lord, I just believe that you're dealing with our hearts on a really deep level this morning. Just before we even go on any further, I just want to thank you for your wonderful grace. Lord, I thank you that nobody could fulfill the law, so you sent your son Jesus to be the man that would fulfill the law, that would covenant with God and invite us in. And even when we are faithless, Lord, you remain faithful. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your kindness. And thank you, Lord, that you help us when we're not always feeling so great about ourselves. May we find it in our hearts to be thankful and allow transaction within us to begin to take place. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. So worship is truly, I want you to think about the statement, worship is truly the fruit of gratitude. We enter with thanksgiving. First and foremost, we come and we have this thanksgiving. So, so it's important that you understand worship is really the fruit of gratitude. So I want to take you through this portion of Scripture in Luke chapter 10. It's very interesting. And it's Mary and Martha. And I love the story of, uh, of Mary and Martha. They have two totally different perspectives. And one of them's really uptight about everything that needs to be done. How many of you find yourself like that from time to time? Just confession's good for the soul. Go ahead and raise them up. Uh, and so, you know, some of you really uptight about what needs to be done. And then, uh, then uh, Mary, that's Martha. Mary, she was just worshipful at the feet of Jesus. Like, that'll all get done. How many of you have no problem procrastinating? I love this verse for you. This works really well for you. There's some other verses that kind of go a different direction, but this is really good for you if you're if you're a worshipful procrastinator. <laughs> so Luke 10, 38 to 42, as Jesus and his disciples came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home, she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. There were a lot of things that legitimately need to be done, and she was distracted by those things. That's, that's what it's saying. Those things needed to be done, but she had grown distracted by focusing on them with too much attention. So Martha was distracted with all the preparations, and she came to Jesus, and she said, isn't it interesting what happens when you get distracted? Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Now, she was seated at his feet, and she's now talking, to, the sister's talking to Jesus, so Martha's talking to Jesus, and Mary's at her feet. Do you think Martha's hearing this? Like, she's most likely listening to everything going on. That's kind of interesting. So don't you care that this chick sitting in here doing nothing is wasting time while I've got all this to do? Tell her to help me. And I love this. Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you're worried and upset about many things, but I only have, but only one thing is really needed Mary has chosen what is better. Now, I'm going to drop kind of a big revelation statement to you in a moment, but I, I first want to just say, we don't, we don't do what we do here without a lot of things needing to get done. There are a lot of things needing to get done. That's why text DESTINY to 47474747 and figure out how you can help. I mean, it'd be great. We, when I came in this morning, I want to say thank you to Josh Price. Josh, you back there. Josh, uh, I, when I walk through the door, he's up here on camera. He's trying to take care of several hats this morning. And so uh, I, I walked in this morning, and, and he's got a lift out, and he's up trying to take care of something going on with that camera. Um, and I just kind of started looking around at who all was here when I arrived, already doing stuff. And I came pretty early. I, I come before an 8 o'clock meeting. So people showed up really early. Uh, Tiffany Edgington, Tiffany. I just want to say thank you. You were in here working 
putting communion together with Barb, who every week spearheads all of that effort. Uh, Emily and Nicole were back in the back with ready, tech ready to go. Um, I saw Rachel and Chloe uh, making coffee. How many of you thank God for coffee on a cold morning? Thank you very much for serving out there and working, putting all that together. Um, I, you know, I just started thinking about all the things that needed to be done. Things truly need to be done. But what we have to do is not let the things that need to be done become a distraction in our lives. And here's, here's the big statement. I think it's, yeah, this is for you to write in your brain. When we are distracted from worship, we are prone to complain. When we are distracted from worship, we are prone to complain. I mean, the littlest things can become the biggest deals when we're focusing on the wrong stuff in life. How many of you know? And if we'll really rehearse the goodness of God and come back over and over again and give thanks in every circumstance, then it empowers us to understand the revelation of joy that gets awakened. You know, what I'm talking to you about is what God wants to do in your heart. In a few moments, we're going to just take like we normally do. We want to conclude with worship. Why do we do that? Because hopefully there's some deposits that God is making in us as we're under the, the sound of His voice and the power of His Word. And when the Holy Spirit blows inspiration over those seeds, they really take root and they begin to grow and produce fruit. And so that's part of why we come back in to a place of worship. Whatever God stirred in your heart, it's where you can just pause for a moment and just say, all right, Lord, deepen that in me. How many of you, the, the Lord's made some deposits in you this morning? So we've been sitting in this room. He's made some deposits. And this is that moment where you say, okay, Lord, deepen that in me. That, that I not just hear it and walk away and not be a doer of the word. We want to be doers and hearers. That's why we give you an action point every week. We love God's presence. How many of you love God's presence? Why don't we just celebrate God's presence? Just thank God for his wonderful presence. He's a God who loves for us to experience and explore his amazing presence. And that we are people of God's presence. I want you to know, Destiny family, you are marked by God as a person with an appetite for God's presence. And that's why that expresses who we are. You see that last little phrase on your, on your blank every single week, and it's GP2RL. God's presence comes to real life. That's what we do. We bring God's presence to real life. So we take what God's deposited and then we begin to bring application to it. There's something deeply spiritual about your practical life. How many of you agree with that? And there's something deeply practical about your spiritual life. How many of you agree with that? I love to tell my wife I love her. Man, I love to just kiss her lips. Something practical about that now. I'm feeling something practical stirring in my heart right now. Come on, it's both. There's something really spiritual about praying for your family. And there's something really practical about having a family night where you have fun. Where you go for a walk and you turn it into a scavenger hunt. And the first five, first person to find these five things, it just makes it, it, it awakens it. It's wonderful. And I pray for my family, but I want to have fun too. I want to do practical things. You, you got to understand. The practical thing of the, spirit, uh, of the spiritual, spiritual element that I'm talking to you about this week is to specifically give thanks. So let's just stand to our feet, everybody. I'll give you your last blank in just a moment, I know. I, I, I get a lot of chatter after church if I miss a blank, I'll tell you. <laughs> I said this a few weeks ago, and I just want to reiterate, a healthy comparison brings the right focus. So what are you comparing yourself to? And that brings the right focus. When we compare ourselves to people who have more than us, it awakens a complaint that we don't have more. Are you hearing me? But when we compare ourselves to people who have less than us, it awakens compassion for us to care more about those people in need. So that's why I brought this emphasis of first world problems. Here's a picture of, uh, of a world of water comparison. And it's just so amazing that we think about the water, that we have clean water in America. And, and so uh, with no question, and you know, here's a, a village where they began to provide clean water. And there's a comparison of the water they used to drink and now the water they get to drink. 
How many of you know we are so blessed in this, in our country, in our nation? I am so thankful. But what happens is we live in the wealthiest nation in the world, in the top 1% of the wealthiest people on the planet, and all we seem to focus on is the less than 1% that has more than us. And when we give that comparison wrong, it awakens a complaint. But when we get that comparison right, it awakens compassion. So are you driven by complaint or are you driven by compassion? It really depends on the comparison going on in your heart. I'm talking to you about what's going on in your heart. So we give thanks today. We give thanks. That, that's your blank. Is your perspective born from compassion or driven by complaint? So we just want compassion to be awakened within us. Lord, we, we love you and we thank you for the goodness of God. We thank you for the faithfulness of God. We thank you for the healing power of God, for the provision of God. I thank you, Lord, this week there are some wonderful testimonies about to happen. And I believe that much of it is born from our willingness to unlock things of the kingdom by giving thanks well in advance in Jesus' mighty name. Lord, deliver us from this skepticism when we even hear those words that would cause us to dismantle any type of faith for that to take place. And I pray, Father, right now you would awaken something in our hearts. Awaken something powerful, bold, and big in our hearts. In the name of Jesus, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord God. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Lord, we give thanks for the rescuing release of your son, Jesus, who came, lived, died on a cross, was buried in a grave, but three days later, was risen from the grave to produce and release life in the earth to all humanity that would embrace Jesus as their Savior. We acknowledge, Jesus, you are who you say you are. We need you in our lives to rescue us every day, not just being our Savior, but being Lord of our lives in the name of Jesus. Come on, if you agree with that declaration of salvation and lordship, why don't you give him praise today? Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Somebody shout amen. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord.